What's up everybody, welcome back to the channel. My name is Kenny and today we are talking about one of the most notorious crime cases in New Zealand history. Since 1954, when this crime was committed, it has inspired books, plays, and even a Peter Jackson film, Heavenly Creatures. It remains a subject of fascination all these years later because at the time of the crime, Pauline Parker, who was technically born Pauline Reaper, and Juliet Hume were both teenage girls. The two had an intense connection and a seemingly romantic and spiritual one. What made them do what they did? One day in June 1954, the girls went to Victoria Park in Christchurch, New Zealand with Pauline's mother. But it would be the last thing Pauline's mother would ever do. So let's get into this fascinating story. Juliet Hume was born on October 28, 1938 in Blackheath, London. She was the daughter of a physicist, Dr. Henry Rainsford Hume. Henry was extremely intelligent, having studied mathematics and physics and had a particularly keen interest in quantum mechanics and quantum theory. He was also part of the Manhattan Project, and honestly, if I wanted to list off all of Henry's academic accomplishments, this would turn into a two-hour-long episode. He met Juliet's mother, Hilda, in 1936 at the University of Liverpool. Hilda and Henry didn't really seem like they would make a good couple, um, but they went along with it anyways. Uh, they were just very different. Uh, Henry was more reserved, uh, very quiet, and Hilda really liked going out and socializing. Again, something Henry really didn't like doing. Uh, and this will all come back into the story later. Either way, two years after they met, Juliet was born. Juliet was born right at the start of World War II, pretty much, and the family went through a lot while living in London during this time period, like most families did. Juliet is known to have developed PTSD from the bombings that went on uh, when she was very young. Hilda would also have a second child, a boy named Jonathan. Juliet suffered from multiple childhood illnesses, pneumonia, a bad case of bronchitis, and tuberculosis. Due to her illnesses, Juliet was sent from the UK to the Bahamas to live with friends of the family, where she could possibly get better with warmer weather. Something to say about Juliet's mom, Hilda. It seems like she wasn't a very loving mother, and I know that sounds judgmental of me, but I mean, that's just kind of how she, she was. You know, even though she had two kids, she didn't really like being hands-on, and honestly, she thought Juliet wanted too much attention. It seems like maybe she was trying to get rid of Juliet for a while, um, as she thought Juliet was a burden. But at the same time, maybe the reason for sending her to the Bahamas was real. Who knows? But eventually, Juliet was sent to live in the Bay of Islands in New Zealand with more friends of the family. And months later, Henry got a job as the rector at Cantonbury College in Christchurch, which was also in New Zealand. So the family moved to Christchurch, and eventually Juliet followed them. And they got settled into a new house, into a new home. And, you know, Henry had a pretty good reputation. Like I said earlier, he was extremely intelligent. He had done a lot of things um, in the academic world. And people knew, obviously, he had gotten this job. And people knew he was coming. And they were very excited to have this, you know, renowned uh, physicist pretty much living in their town, living in their city, and um, having the job title he would have. But it's funny because eventually, you know, they kind of realized that he wasn't really a socialite. He didn't really like doing anything. And Hilda kind of thought she was above everyone else. So they kind of had this weird reputation in town. And honestly, they didn't end up having very many friends because of each one of their quirks. I don't know if quirks is the right word, but just their personalities. So Pauline Parker was born on May 26, 1938 in Christchurch, New Zealand. Pauline's father was Herbert Reaper, and before Pauline was born, he was married to Louisa Reaper. They had two sons together, but they weren't very happy. At least Herbert wasn't very happy. He met Honora Parker, and she and Herbert, they got along really well, much better than you know he and his wife did. And also, she was 22 years younger than his wife, so that probably has something to do with it. Herbert left his family, and he and Honora ran off together. And in order to evade his previous family, they would, basically anywhere they would live, they would put it under the name Honora Reaper, showing that Honora was now married to Herbert Reaper, except they actually weren't married. But they would go on to have four children, including Pauline Parker, or technically Pauline Reaper. It's kind of weird. Either way, we're going with Pauline Parker for this episode. At age five, 
Pauline was hospitalized for osteomyelitis, which is a bone marrow infection that left her with chronic leg pain well into her teens. And honestly, it's really, really, really bad. From what I've read, it's just terrible. And eventually, Pauline Parker and Juliet Hume would meet at Christ Church Girls High School in 1952. When the girls met, Pauline was 14 and Juliet was 13. And both girls were unable to participate in physical activities um, during school due to their poor health. And eventually, uh, they bonded over tales of their childhood illnesses. After getting to know each other, they discovered that they both had a shared passion for fantasy. From there, their friendship became gradually more intense. And they began writing uh, books and stories and plays together and eventually would start acting them out, creating new names for each other. Pauline became Gina and Juliet was Deborah. They created their own religion and with it an alternative to heaven they called the fourth world. And honestly, it, it makes a lot of sense because with both of them having the illnesses that they had growing up, and especially Juliet, really they weren't in school a lot when they were growing up, and, so, and they didn't have a ton of friends, and so they really had to use their own imagination to sort of get through daily life. And so when they both met each other and they both realized that that's how both of them were, they really, really clicked, and they just started you know, getting very intense and kind of out of this world with things. In the fourth world, they believed that music and art were celebrated above Christianity. They began worshiping celebrities that they believed to be saints in the fourth world, including an opera singer that they both loved, Mario Lanza. Maybe Mario Lanza. Either way, both girls dreamed of moving to Hollywood and publishing their books. The further they developed their fantasy lives, the more they became inseparable. Uh, something that caused Pauline and Juliet's parents to worry as time went on. And honestly, mostly Pauline's. We'll get into that, into that in a second. But one time in August of 1952, the two girls were together riding bikes. The two came along uh, or came upon a big open field and went running into it. And at one point, they decided to take off all their clothes and dance and enjoy the freedom. Pauline's mother in particular, though, uh, and you can kind of see why. I mean, I don't know if she even knew about this, but just based on everything else, suspected that their daughters may be in a sexual relationship. You know, homosexuality at this point in time uh, was considered a serious mental illness. Now, Juliet later in life would deny that they were a romantic couple, though she did admit that the two were completely obsessed with one another. Even with Juliet denying this, I'm kind of curious, what do you think about this? Now, Something else I forgot to mention just a second ago. The two girls would take baths with one another. Now, they're not, I don't know, they're still kids. You know, they're 13, 14 years old at this time, but they're not really young. It sort of seems, especially with everything else that's going on in their lives, uh, with how they interact with one another, it might seem a bit odd. Uh, maybe not that odd because, again, they're still young. It just sort of depends. Uh, but it seems definitely like there is some... There is a romantic relationship going on between them. Like I mentioned earlier, of the two families, Juliet's mother seemed less concerned and allowed Pauline to continue coming into their home for overnight stays. And again, you know, Juliet's mom, Hilda, she kind of just wanted to lead her own life and she wanted to socialize and look down upon the people of the city. And she really didn't have a lot of time for Juliet. So I. It didn't seem like she was that concerned with whatever she was doing. Now, Pauline, though, she saw Juliet's mother and father in a different sort of way than Juliet did. You know, Juliet saw them as, as parents, but Pauline saw them as sophisticated, open, and just different than her own parents in a lot of different ways. This would cause Pauline to feel resentment over her own home life and her own parents. Juliet's mother, Hilda, thought that it was good that Juliet had made a friend and really, again, like I said, didn't see anything wrong with this. Pauline's mother, Honora, did not agree. Honestly, I can kind of see why this is, though. And you know, I, I'll explain, because Juliet was seen as the leader between the two. And when they would write stories together, Pauline seemed to mostly have a lesser role in whatever story they were doing. Now, that seems like maybe it was like that in the beginning, they both were completely obsessed with one another, but Juliet definitely had a bit more of an ego than Pauline. 
And when you really look at the story, it really seems like Pauline was following Juliet with whatever she wanted to do. You know, she was very much, you know, like obsessed with her. And, and Juliet was obsessed with Pauline in her own way as well. And all of this really caused Pauline's mother to think that Juliet was a bad influence. Now, eventually, Juliet was uh, once again hospitalized for tuberculosis. Uh, the girl's parents saw this as an opportunity for, the, for them to spend some time apart in the hopes that their relationship would become less intense. But Pauline continued to write adamantly to her friend in the hospital, and she was really the only one to write to her in the hospital. I, I think her mom visited her once, I believe, if I remember that right. But for, and for the most part, she didn't have visitors. She didn't have a lot of other friends that were writing her. So it was mostly just Pauline. And in fact, they wrote letters to each other in different characters. Juliet was Prince Charles, and Pauline was Lance. So they would write pages and pages of fictional stories back and forth, as well as letters from their actual selves. As you know, So they were writing fictional and real letters back and forth. It seems like maybe what they were doing was basically going through and writing these big fictional stories, and then maybe at the end writing, you know, what you know from their actual personalities or actual you know non NPC characters, right? Um, but so they were writing back and forth all the time. And once Juliet was released from the hospital, their friendship resumed right where it had left off. And Juliet later said that she felt indebted to her friend for being the only one to write to her while she was sick. And this might be maybe the time where they become a little bit more equals uh, in Juliet's eyes. Again, they were always sort of like that, but Juliet always, you know, viewed herself as as higher than everyone else, kind of like her mom. So, you know, at this point, it might seem like that kind of evened off a little bit. So during the next summer holiday in 1953, Pauline wasn't invited over to the Hume house as she had been the previous years. And Pauline's parents they were starting to get really troubled by their daughter's obsessive behavior and took Pauline to see a psychiatrist. Now, this psychiatrist believed from everything that he had heard that the girls did indeed have a sexual relationship. And one thing to note, before Pauline went in to see the psychiatrist, her parents went in first to talk to the psychiatrist, which seems kind of weird. Seems like that's not how it should be. But in 1954, it seemed as if, because of all this, the girls might be separated for good. Juliet's father discovered that his wife was having an affair. Now, during this time, Juliet and Pauline had been talking deeply about going to America, specifically Los Angeles. They had come up with this entire plan, and Juliet wanted to talk to her mother about it. And when she actually went to talk to her, she caught her mom and her new lover in bed. Hilda told Juliet that her father knew what was going on and that they had all planned to live together. That is, Hilda, Henry, and Hilda's new lover. And that everyone thought that was going to be okay. It's hard to know exactly if this is true. That's just what she told her at the time. And Juliet seemed amused by this, uh, but went on to tell Hilda about the plans for them to go to America. And one reason she was telling her this is because, I mean, she was just they were just trying to get a plan together, and obviously to get there, they would need money. Now, I want to say it doesn't seem like Hilda actually told Henry what was going on at this point, like she said, but it's possible. Either way, Henry was also having an affair with a young woman anyways, so I don't think he minded. Uh, they were both pretty much checked out of that marriage at that point. It seems like Hilda went and then told Henry about the conversation that she had had with Juliet about them going to America, because Henry then went and talked to Juliet and Pauline. After that conversation, everything kind of seemed to be up in the air, but uh, Juliet and Pauline seemed kind of better after talking to Henry for some reason. Seems like maybe Henry just had a way with words that would sort of help, I don't know, calm them down about getting so passionate about doing it. But at the same time, no one really knew what was going on. Now a plan started to unfold in Henry and Hilda's minds. And at the time, Henry, just amongst everything that was going on, he wanted to go back to England. But he thought he could take Juliet to South Africa first, where she would stay with his sister. He would just move to England, get settled, and bring Juliet to England eventually uh, whenever he was settled in. You know, so the girls, uh, upon hearing this, came up with the idea 
that they would both go to South Africa together and then eventually figure out a way to go to America. And it seemed like a great idea. They were sure that Hilda and Henry would be fine with it, but Pauline's mother, Honora, not so much. In their eyes, Honora was the one obstacle that was keeping them from being together. So they began to form a plan of their own. Step one, get rid of Honora. So, murder her. Step two was to go to South Africa and then run away to Hollywood, possibly New York, but really they wanted to go to Hollywood, Los Angeles. And in the same way that they had always fed each other's imaginations, the girls became more and more convinced that this plan would work. I mean, they have no idea what they're doing, but they seem to think that they can figure it out. And, you know, the end goal for them was to end up in America writing, publishing their books, uh, becoming actresses, and living happily ever after. It's It sort of just seems like you know, they, they've just gone so deep into this fantasy, this teenage fantasy. Like, we all sort of have fantasies when you're 15 years old, but, man, they're going deep into it. Because, remember, this plan involves murder. Now, this was in June of 1954, and later at the trial, Pauline's diary was produced as evidence that her mother's death was planned in advance. In this diary, on June 19th, Pauline said that they were, quote, thrilled by the idea. Naturally, we feel a trifle nervous, but the pleasure of anticipation is great, unquote. On June 21st, she said, quote, we decided to use a rock in a stocking rather than a sandbag. We discussed the murder. I feel keyed up as if I were planning a surprise party, unquote. That's sort of the plan. So what they wanted to do was, at first, use a sandbag to beat her mother, Pauline's mother. Uh, but they changed that, and they said they were going to use a rock in a stocking. So on the morning of June 22nd, 1954, the day after Pauline wrote that in her diary, Juliet was getting ready at her house to spend the day with Pauline and Pauline's mother, Honora. Before she left for Pauline's house, Juliet took a half brick near her garage and wrapped it in paper and put it in her bag. When they were at Pauline's house, Juliet gave the brick to Pauline, who then put it in a stocking and put it in her bag. The plan for the day was for all three of them to go to Victoria Park in Christchurch. And now they left for Victoria Park, and before they wanted to start the day, all three of them had tea at a kiosk in the park. After drinking tea and eating snacks, the three of them took off down a trail for a walk. They waited until they were nearly 500 feet down the path in a wooded area before Juliet dropped a pink stone so that Honora would lean over to retrieve it. As soon as she did... Pauline bludgeoned her with the half of a brick they had tied in an old stocking. Juliet helped take Honora down to the ground and at one point took the weapon and actually took over. They believed that one blow to the head would do the trick, but Honora had to be struck at least 20 times for this to work. Now, you know, they're used to watching movies. They think it's going to be easy. A lot of them do, but as we've learned on this channel, it's never easy. Both girls went running back up the path, covered in blood. They ran to the tea kiosk where the three of them had eaten only minutes before and told the owners, Agnes and Kenneth Ritchie, that Pauline's mother had tripped and hit her head. Agnes took the girls inside the kiosk while Kenneth Ritchie went down the path to see what had happened. Kenneth discovered Honora's body with major lacerations on her head, neck, and face. He noticed that her injuries did not seem to come from an accident like a trip and fall. When the police arrived, they discovered the half of brick inside a blood-covered stocking in the nearby woods and came to the same conclusion about the accident. But by the time the police had arrived, Henry had already come and picked up the girls and left. Henry took the girls back to their house, and Juliet's house, that is, and they kind of went on to have a normal-ish day. And now this is all pretty weird. Henry comes. He's called, right? Uh, by Agnes Ritchie and is told to, you know, that there was an accident to come pick up the girls. So he arrives, he picks up the girls who are covered in blood and just takes them home, which is really weird. Like the police are coming. This is, why would you do this? I don't know. But that's what happens. And um, it's pretty suspicious, obviously. Like I said, she didn't trip. So the police knew something was up. And right away, they brought in a special criminal investigation unit. Now, later that night, the investigators arrived at the Hume home, and Pauline's father gave them permission to interview her, and actually, police called ahead to let them know they were on the way. And maybe they did this because the girls were underage, 
Maybe they did it because Henry was a well-known figure uh, in the city, but either way, that's what they did. And now what that meant was Hilda had time to prepare. She went up to Juliet's room to look through her diaries. And by the way, the girls were asleep at this time because of a sedative that Hilda's you know, new lover had given them. So basically, Hilda's new boo was drugging the girls and making them go to sleep. I guess he was just trying to help. But after Hilda hid some of Juliet's diaries uh, that gave away their intentions, the adults woke up the girls and got them ready for the police uh, arrival. Now, the police talked to the girls, and they basically told them that there was no way that Honora had died from just tripping and falling and hitting a rock. Pauline told the police the story of Honora tripping and hitting her head on a rock over and over again, but the police weren't buying it, which makes sense because how could that possibly happen? Honora would have to have fallen and hit her head on the same rock over and over and over again. That's just not how it works. And the police asked why they found a bloody stocking at the scene, and Pauline told them that she had had it on her. Uh, Not that she was wearing it, but that she just carries around an extra stocking and used it to try and uh, wipe up the blood. Again, another ridiculous story, and the police were just trying to catch her in her lies, it seems. After they got done with Pauline, they talked to Juliet. Now, Juliet was not giving the exact same story. She said that she had walked away from Pauline and Honora, and that when she came back, Honora was on the ground already, and Pauline was freaking out, trying to figure out what to do. The police went back to Pauline, and like they do, they tried to pin it all on her and told her what Juliet had said. And eventually, Pauline confessed, but she told the police that Juliet had nothing to do with it, which is pretty loyal, all things considered. So Pauline was arrested and taken in without Juliet. So how does Juliet get back into this? I mean, she seems to be off, scot-free. But basically, when Pauline was in jail, she was still allowed, for whatever reason, to keep a diary. And I don't know if it's a real diary or if they just gave her a pen and piece of paper. It seems like that maybe that was what it was. Uh, either way, she wrote down that she had gotten away with it. At least, she had gotten Juliet away with it. That the Hume family was so nice to her and that no one had found out that it was actually both of them. And of course this was going to be read by the police. And after this, the police, they were like, maybe there's some more diaries. So they went back to Pauline's house, checked other diaries, and the diaries obviously spilled all the beans. Hilda had spent days getting rid of evidence at the house that might implement Juliet, but it didn't matter, because when police got there and questioned Juliet again, she told them everything. She told them that it was both of them. I mean, she told the truth. And she was arrested and taken in. And she was actually put in the same jail cell as Pauline, which is really weird. And when they were in the same jail cell together, they were just hanging out. Like, they were being watched, obviously, by uh, officers. But they, I mean, supposedly they weren't, they weren't talking about the murder. They were just hanging out, talking, being themselves in the jail cell. Kind of not thinking about what could happen in the future. So, kind of makes sense given their past. So this was a huge deal in New Zealand. Nothing like this had really ever happened, and the fact that they were both looked upon as dirty-minded little girls made everything worse. I mean, yeah, these were two teenage, supposedly lesbian girls, I'm not just saying supposedly, seems like they were, who had killed the mother of one of them. I mean, she's dead. So this this was a very unique case, especially for the time and place. So the diaries were found by investigators, and again, they, they both made full confessions. This would serve as a slight problem by the defense. The only real argument the defense saw was guilty by reason of insanity. But regardless of how the public saw them, the court declared that they were sane enough to stand trial. Outside of the court, the news, media, and general public were trying to figure out if they were mad or bad. They Are they psychologically insane, uh, or were they evil lesbians? Uh, and that's, those aren't my words. Those are uh, the, the, the media. The two girls acted cold towards anyone except each other through everything, through court, uh, through everything. They both claimed they would do it again, 
And Juliet claimed that she would kill anyone who got in her way, got in the way of her and Pauline's relationship. They both said they were happy that they did it. And they admitted that how they had acted after it happened was nothing more than a ruse. The court shot down the idea that they were guilty by reason of insanity. But then they get the idea that the two girls could have folia do. And I think I pronounced that right. This is called a madness for two. This is when two people share psychotic disorders, and it's a very rare clinical syndrome. And how this works is a transmission of delusions from the inducer to another person. The inducer is the patient who originally suffered from a psychotic disorder alone and then transferred all or some parts of the disorder to someone else. It can also be shared between more than two people. And it's uh, mostly observed between people who get really close, just like the girls did, and has been noticed in more women than men. I'm going to put an article about this in the description below if you want to know more, because it's pretty interesting. Now, if for some reason they would have been found not guilty by reason of insanity, they most likely would have been put into a psychiatric hospital for the rest of their lives, because that's, that's I mean, that's what it was happening at the time. They did have the death penalty, but they were too young for that. And because homosexuality at the time was viewed as a mental illness, the most common treatment for it was prefrontal lobotomy. So it definitely seems worse to be found not guilty by reason of insanity because they probably would have been, it wouldn't have been very good. In two and a half hours, the verdict came back from the jury as guilty. And again, they were tried as minors because they both were. A 1954 news report noted that after the verdict was delivered, Pauline looked across at Juliet and whispered something, and they both smiled. And in fact, throughout the whole trial, both the girls acted like that. They were smiling, laughing, whispering, but only at each other. They weren't smiling, laughing, and whispering at anyone else. They were, they were, they were both still living, living in a fantasy world, even though they were in court. Uh, and they were told to stop throughout the entire thing, but you know how it is. The girls served five years in separate prisons. Pauline in Christchurch, and Juliet in Auckland. Uh, Hilda married Bill, her her new lover that she had had an affair on, Henry, with, and eventually she changed her name, and they moved out of New, Le- new Zealand, and they left Juliet. Henry moved back to England and eventually got remarried. And throughout both their times in prison, they both came up with ways of dealing with what they did. Eventually, both of them would feel like the bond they once shared had vanished. Now, when they were released from prison in 1959, the girls went their separate ways, under new identities. Juliet moved back to England and would go by the name Anne Stewart Perry. And for a while, she held different jobs, eventually taking up work as a flight attendant. It seems like she took this job because she was able to get a passport and a visa and travel to the United States. Eventually, she went to Los Angeles, quit her job, stayed there, and she became a Mormon in her mid-twenties. So she really found God. In 1979, she published her first novel under her new name, Anne Perry. She went on to write several other books and lead a successful career as a historic, uh, historical mystery novelist, all without revealing her actual previous identity and personal history with murder. In 1994, shortly following the release of a film adaptation of the case, Heavenly Creatures, journalist Lynn Ferguson made the discovery that Anne Perry was actually Juliet Hume. Heavenly Creatures was a film by Peter Jackson, who would of course go on to direct the Lord of the Rings trilogy and many other films. The film won an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay, and it was the first film by Peter Jackson to actually find mainstream success. And when confronted by journalists, Anne admitted that this was true and has been pretty forthcoming with journalists about what happened when she was young. She said she made peace with what happened and due to her Mormon beliefs, she would be forgiven. And honestly, it makes sense that she would join the, the Mormon church because she's not, she's not going to hell, right? If she joins. Anne claimed that she and Pauline never had a sexual relationship and that she had assisted her friend with the murder because she felt indebted to her, and also because she feared Pauline might have, you know, done herself in if she hadn't gone along with the plan. And again, who knows if they were, you know, actually in a sexual relationship. It's, you know, 
they were just doing things at the time. And, you know, after all of this, neither one of them that I've been able to see has, you know, I mean, I, I know I, that I've read that Pauline had relationships with men after she got out of prison and, and two, maybe I'm not sure. I haven't seen too much about that, but so again, you know, I'm not trying to say that they are necessarily. It just kind of depends. I kind of want to know what you guys think about that. What do you think? Uh, but as for Pauline's side of the story, her whereabouts were somewhat of a mystery until journalist Chris Cook located her in the UK. She was living a recluse, uh, reclusive, devout life, teaching children to ride horses. And like Anne, she had changed her name. She went by Hillary Nathan. And Hillary didn't wish to speak to journalists, but her sister, Wendy, said that Hillary was a devout Roman Catholic who spent most of her life, or most of her time, rather, in prayer, closed off from the world, uh, including any notion of Anne Perry. Wendy said that their mother's death was a situation that got out of hand, and that Hillary was very sorry about it, and it took her about five years to realize what she had actually done. So there's something really about this story that it's it's just it's it's crazy because they were so into it before and then they did it and even right after they did this they still i mean through the through the entire court process they were still all about that you know um nothing had really changed and then they got separated put into separate prisons for 5 years and then all of a sudden they never have contact and i you know I can't say if they ever had contact again. They they both have lived long lives. So we don't know for sure, right? Now they both said that that they haven't uh, in different period in different points, but I mean, would they say if they had necessarily, you know? It's kind of hard to say. And like I said, they've lived very long lives. So to think that they've never been in contact again, I don't really think that that's true, but it could be. It's it's very hard to say. But yeah, the story was crazy. It's very interesting. Um, thank you for listening to it. If you want to join us on Patreon, you'll get the episodes early. And I'm going to start putting the names of everyone on Patreon listed as the end credits, starting with this video, if I can figure out how to do it. I'm pretty sure I know how. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week. You must be destroyed.